The first time I ever had one of these things on uh, was, uh, I was about two years into being the KRC director, so it was 1980, I think, or 78. The Surface Mining Act had just been passed after a decade of struggle trying to, to actually ban strip mining. Uh, we ended up with a regulatory program. And I was on a KUT show with three coal guys, right? One of them was nominally a government guy. He was the head of MSHA, which is the Mine Safety Health Administration. And then the guy who was the head of Island Creek, who had just cut a big deal with China over coal. And I realized the odds were not good. So I needed to at least get one of them out of the equation. So I looked over at the guy who was the Island Creek representative, Stony Stoneman or something. And I said, so uh, after what the uh, Chinese did to the students at Tiananmen, you guys are going to be pulling your, your uh, uh, business agreement, aren't you? He said, what? I said, oh, I said, no, we're not. I said, listen, I said, that thing that they're putting on, because they were just then snaking it up his shirt, I said, as long as you don't touch it and sweat, you'll be fine. <laughs> and, and it won't shock you. So he spent the first 15 minutes of the show like, like this, <laughs> trying to keep it from touching his skin. So I was like, one down, I like the odds now, so we're good. So anyhow, um, it is a privilege, okay? This is like ground zero for cool in Kentucky, okay? Between the Sisters of Nazareth and the Sisters of Loretto, I have never met a, a more powerful group of kick-ass women in my entire life. And when the Williams Company tried to put a pipeline through this area, I was, the first thought is, what are you thinking? What in the world are you thinking? And when the, uh, the sisters of Loretto and the sisters of Nather had made it very clear that they had no interest in the pipeline, as did the monks over at Gethsemane, somebody wrote and said, is this a case of none shall pass? <laughs> <coughs> or is this a case of friar restraint? I said, well, you know, that is the Holy Land, okay? And so this is, this is living proof that the Williams Company people will never make it to the Holy Land. Uh, somebody else said, you're all wrong. It's a case of Downton Abbey. <laughs> I said, they're doubting all right. So, so I wanted to talk very briefly about how we got here, not in a metaphysical sense, in a much more limited solar sense, uh, although that is the source. Uh, the, I wanted to also talk about what you can do and, and what needs to be done. And I appreciate the fact that, that um, the first thing I instilled in karma was a sense of guilt. I was like, okay, you know, I'm three quarters Irish Catholic, one quarter Jewish. We got the corner on guilt. <laughs> so yeah. so uh, the... Um, about five years ago, the, the uh, Kentucky regulated utilities, the non-municipal utilities, non-TVA uh, facilities, decided to go to war on solar energy customers. Okay? They decided to go to war on distributed generation, which is generation that people put on their rooftop or on their barn top or whatever, and they feed into the grid uh, and have kind of a, a, a partnership relationship with the utilities. Now, they did this not because there's any particular negative impact on solar customers, on what we would call non-participating customers. Okay. Why they did it is beyond me, um, but it is a, a fight that they picked, uh, a fight that they had to fight despite spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, which they may try to get back from ratepayers, and we will be there to make sure that doesn't happen, because you don't get paid for going to war with some of your customers. They wanted to reduce the value of what is fed back into the grid. Now they tried a number of different ways to do it. First they wanted to come in and legislate the fact that the value of solar is the avoided cost of them having to crank up their coal-fired plants a little bit more and generate another kilowatt. Well, that didn't fly. So then they came back with a second approach, and a third approach, and a fourth approach. What the solar customers and the solar installers wanted was a fair shot at determining how to value solar. Because right now, you're probably aware, I have a solar array on my house. I'm linked into the grid. There are certain times of the day, certain times of the month, certain times of the year, certain times of an hour where I am generating electricity. I'm also consuming some, and my, the excess over what I'm consuming is going into the grid. And then I am using grid-generated electricity at a different time when I'm not generating enough to meet my needs. 
Under the current law, the meters that we have go both ways. And they net out what is going one way as opposed to the other way. And there is a credit or a charge. There's no money. The value of it is one kilowatt to one kilowatt. That's the way it's been for a number of years. In fact, the, it was a farmer who went to the most conservative member of the, U, of the Kentucky Senate, probably, one of the most conservative, and said, this is a good idea for farmers. And that's why we ended up with net metering in the first place. The utilities have decided that what is being fed into the grid should be devalued. They're doing this at the same time that they are building overpriced solar arrays for the people who can neither afford or can't, don't have a, the uh, house is not oriented in the proper fashion. There's what, about 30% of the people can use solar, rooftop solar? Oh, yeah. About 30, 35%, somewhere in there, so, right? So they're looking to push out of the market those who would take more control over their energy future. And when I say that, I'm thinking of the guy who is the tenant farmer for somebody who owns a farm down in Western Kentucky, who built his own solar array and put it on his house and cut by two thirds the money that he was paying or overpaying to the co-op there who was charging more to the 110 customers that 110,000 customers that remain in their system after the smelters were able to bail out and go to market to get cheaper gas fired power. So he was able to get control over his meager income. So when you hear this is an urban wealthy against a rural poor issue, that's hogwash. What this is, is individuals taking charge over their energy future and the uncertainties of their ever rising utility bills versus a utility whose model has been built on selling more kilowatts, who is now facing a future where people are using less per capita and they've got a tremendous overcapacity in their systems because they assumed that people would be using more than they in fact are using. So in this battle, we managed, we the collective we, and I know a number of you reached out to your legislators. I know a number of you were there. You know, they had their high priced utility lobbyists, 23 contract lobbyists hired just this past session to try to push a bill through. And I can tell you, after 42 years of, of being a legislative lobbyist, anytime you need more than five people on your bill, you got a really bad bill. So this one is right up there in the pantheon of really bad bills. And th so they managed to, to push it through. But the opposition to their bill cut across all boundaries. It wasn't a Dem versus Republican issue. It was the most conservative folks understanding they were trying to co corner the market to the most progressive understanding that climate change, climate chaos, got to stop calling it change. Change sounds so predictable and so orderly that climate chaos is real. Right? And so we now have an opportunity. Some people say, oh, this is, you know, this is really, this is not going to be good. I think it's going to be great. Public Service Commission, three appointees all appointed by the current administration, uh, and one a lawyer, one an economist, and one uh, a very conservative uh, person with an economics background, uh, and their staff were tasked by the General Assembly under Senate Bill 100, which you can find on the LRC's website if you want to read the whole thing. It's lrc.ky.gov. You go to the 2019 regular session tab and you click on it. It'll click on Senate Bill 100. It'll give you a description of the bill. Click on it again, you get the actual bill. What it says is after January 1st, 2020, any regulated utility, that's the co-ops and the investor owns, Okay. The munis are not obligated to do anything to change their current relationship. Okay. So there's nothing that pushes the cities to do that. And I'm hopeful that people will talk to their cities and say, we don't want you to change this relationship. The theory that the, the, the companies are advancing is that if I have to give you credit at what's about 12 cents a kilowatt hour or whatever the kilowatt, I have to give you credit for the electricity you're generating. And I could actually generate that electricity myself for about nine cents cheaper. Then you are making me give you more value than I should. And somebody, and you're using less of my product, therefore some of my costs that are over on the volumetric side are not being paid by you. 
Now, mind you, if I put on storm windows and storm doors, I'm probably going to be gener using a whole lot less of your power also, but nobody's going after me, right? In fact, they've been telling for me for years I'm supposed to do that, become more cons you know, conserving in electricity. But their theory is that they should be able to reduce the value of what they're crediting to solar customers. So instead of maybe getting one kilowatt to one kilowatt, you'd be getting a third of kilowatt for what you're generating, and then you'd be paying the full value for what you consume. They're doing that on the assumption that there is no real value to solar. Now, mind you, when they go to the Public Service Commission and want to get their big arrays approved, they say, you know, this is a really good deal because it's de it helps us hedge against climate change. So when they're getting a rate of return on the investment, climate change is real. When the solar customer says you ought to consider that we're helping out on that front, they say, oh, that's an ex externality. We don't have to consider that. We have an opportunity. What's going to happen after January 1st, as John mentioned, is the regulated utilities, the co-ops and KU, lg &E, Duke Energy, uh, Kentucky Power, they have the opportunity to go to the Public Service Commission. They don't have an obligation to do so. But they have the opportunity to file a rate case and say, we propose, based on our numbers, that we should not give a one-to-one -one credit anymore. We should give a one uh, credit uh, and only give them half a credit or a third of a credit. They will be under oath when they do that because everybody's under oath in a rate case. And we will have the opportunity, solar customers, people who are customers of that utility, to intervene in that case and to become parties in determining what that value will be. Now, even though we didn't win on having everything in one case, the first case is the big case. That's the case where we will set the formula for how this is going to be determined for all the other cases. So we will be there on that front to deal with those issues on a technical sense. But that doesn't mean that you're off the hook. Okay? There's a lot that you can do. There's a lot you've already done. We wouldn't be here today if it hadn't been for the pushback they got when they first tried to cram through their bill to legislatively mandate a minimal value for solar. Public Service Commission themselves, after really kind of helping to tank our, our efforts to amend the bill, they have realized that a rate case is not where they first want to start dealing with these issues. So they opened a case. It's called an administrative case. They said, hey, we want the public's comment. Please send us written comments on what you think we need to consider in the issue of net metering. Now, you can get on the Public Service Commission website, psc.ky.gov, and you can go to where it says commission, and you click and it says cases. Right, and so you scroll down to the cases. Here's the one you want. It's 2019-00256. Sure, it's 2019-00256. Now, so if you would, make sure everybody put your email on the list here, and what we'll do is, is we'll get those emails aggregated and we'll send you this information also so that you have it in, uh, in an email and you can work from that. The, um, the, com the commission opened a case. They said, we want public comment. And everything that's in that file is going to be considered when those rate cases come in after January. Okay? Now, if you take solar under a solar tariff, and John's here, and I don't know if there's other installers that are going to be here over the course of the day. You're going to go out and see some installations. But John can put you in touch with people in your area, and uh, the, all of the installers work very closely together in a very collaborative way, and the Solar Energy Industries Association is the best. Okay? We also have a Kentucky Solar Energy Society, which is the supporters of solar, and their website has a lot of great information on it as well. Um, a number of different organizations have links to that. Everybody's working collaboratively and trying to get as many people to send in written comments. Now, in this day and age, you would hope you'd be able to send electronic comments, but for some reason, I think the commission thought they were doing everybody a favor because they assume not everybody has access to the internet, and that's true in some cases. 
But if you want your comments to be considered, they need to be received there by October 15th. Close the okay. business. Um, I'm sorry? Close the business. Close the business. Right. Yeah, they no longer allow the after hours drop box. Yeah. <laughs> um, fortunately, they do electronic filing for most of my cases, so I have until 1159. But I never wait till the last minute. So uh, the uh, now there's also going to be a hearing on November 13th, starting at nine o'clock in Frankfurt at uh, uh, 211 Sauer S O W E R Boulevard in Frankfurt. It's off the bypass, uh, the 127 bypass, and um, and so there's an opportunity before the 15th. There's also an opportunity to to do written and oral comments on November 13th. Um, I'm actually going to write to the PSC and say, look, why don't you just extend the comment, written comment period till the end of the hearing? Why do we have a two-week gap there? Because you're not going to start considering things till after the hearing anyway. So I'm going to try to get that done. But right now, assume October 15th is the deadline. It has to be received by then. So, uh, and you can look and see. They post the next day if things are received. It's going to be in that file on the PSC's website. So what are some of the comments that, that they need to hear? They, they need to hear about the value of solar. They need to hear that you want that, that the objective evidence, there was a DOE study done a year and a half ago that says the whole premise that non-participating customers or end up paying for the participating customers because they're using less electricity is not true. The impacts, the rate impacts on non-participating customers are, quote, minimal. Okay? They are, they are non-inconsequential and will remain that way for the foreseeable future. That was what the DOE concluded. And they were looking at all 50 states. They were looking at states where the penetration of solar in the market is very high. Hawaii, California, some others. And states like Kentucky where it's minimal. We're, we're talking a relative handful of customers. Um, I took the actual Kentucky data and figured out that the actual rate impact on non-participating customers over the course of a year was 0 0.001 cents. Okay. Now, the impact of paying for the many of the other things that relate to the utilities, including their 10% return on investment, is a whole lot higher on customers. So, and that's not even considering what value solar brings to the grid. So we've got this opportunity. It's a great opportunity. Don't worry that your comments aren't going to be technical in nature. There'll be plenty of technical comments in there. Uh, tell them your story. Tell them your hopes regarding how uh, you would hope that the utilities stop waging war on their customers, that they embrace the idea that, a, that the contribution of distributed generation is, has value. That all other things, they always say all other things being equal, blah, blah, blah. All other things aren't equal. Okay? Another kilowatt generated by a solar panel is not the same as a kilowatt generated by a coal-fired utility. Okay? Because the coal-fired capacity, even though the controls are much better than they used to be, the so-called war on coal actually started with George Herbert Walker Bush in 1990 when he had the audacity to require that the coal industry and the utility industry control the emissions coming out of the smokestack so people would stop dying and getting sick. So the, the, all, thing, all things are not equal in this regard. And there is value to solar. And that same, you know, the utilities say there's value to solar in terms of mitigating climate change. They've said it, it's on the record, it's under oath. Okay. That same value needs to be recognized here. The idea that those are externalities that are not to be factored in or, or given any credit is ridiculous. Because externalities have a nasty habit over time of becoming uh, part of the equation at a much higher cost. So that's where we are. We've got our work cut out for us. We have 10 days to get those comments in, and I'm hoping each one of you will do that. You can also email comments in, but they will not go into the same file. So you've got three commissioners. They invited the public to give their comment. What do you think we need to consider? You've got several different websites, the Kentucky Solar Energy Society website, the KSEIA uh, website will link you to them. I think the Kentucky Conservation Committee also has a link on there. Uh, the Resources Council, KYRC.org, will be putting something up this week 
uh, and uh, all of us would encourage you to take the time to have your voice heard. Okay? Uh, the other thing is, if you, if you are customers of a municipal utility, go visit with them. Take some friends and go visit with them and ask them to hold the line and to not change their formula for the net metering, to give full credit where full credit is due. And if you are a customer of an lg &E or a KU or, or of a co-op, encourage them not to rush to change the value of solar. There's nothing in the law that says they have to come in for a rate case. If you're thinking about installing solar, the world is not gonna end on January 1st, 2020. At least that's what the Mayan calendar says. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, they just ran out of wall. That's why it ended you know, in the middle of 1918. Uh, the, uh, What's going to happen is the door is open at that point for a utility to propose a rate case. Rate case take a minimum of 60, 90, 120, maybe 180 days. And so you're not going to get to the end of that road and possibly have a different value until that period of time. But the installers are going to be pretty slammed between now and then. So please call them early. Get a quote. You know you've got until the end of this year, you've got a 30% federal tax credit, which may or may not be extended. It's been extended in the past. I'm hopeful that it'll be extended if you reach out and, and contact your members of Congress um, and encourage them to do so. It may end up as part of a much larger continuing resolution and be kicked down the road for another year or two. But, but there's never been a better time to get on the list, to get a price, to see if it makes sense to look at financing options, because if you start taking under a tariff before the end of that rate case for that utility, you're locked in for 25 years at a one-to-one -one ratio. And if you sell the property, whoever purchases it gets the rest of that 25 years. That was one of the many concessions that the public was able to exact from the utilities as part of the price of them getting their bill through. So happy to answer any questions. Really proud of you all, uh, the sponsors of the day, uh, the wonderful sisters of Nazareth for all they do, and uh, each of you for being here. And it's, it, you know, we've been a little overserved on sun this summer, but we've got some great weather out there today. Question? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I live here in Nelson County, and I'm a member of the Salt River RECC. And what I wanted to know is if they were a part of the coalition that fought against this legislation. I don't think, I don't, so, uh, the Salt River was not, okay, the, uh, the, the, the Kentucky Association of Cooperatives was, okay, and some of the other, yeah, uh, East Kentucky Power was really pushing. Which is where they buy their power. Right, that's the, that's the generation asset. All of the distribution uh, co-ops really were not part of that, even though they're the ones that'll control the net metering relationship. Now, the, the right, the distribution co-ops are the ones that you would have an arrangement with in terms of the tariffs. Um, I don't know that they're obligated uh, to to change if East Ken you know East Kentucky is the generating asset. Uh, they were the ones that were in there lobbying, uh, as well as the investor-owned utilities. Absolutely. And the board. You know, nominally, the co-ops are owned by the members. They're owned by the customers. And, and I think none of the co-ops, nobody is obligated to change the rules. The rules have been in place. They work just fine. Uh, and we've seen a modest growth in solar. We still have a cap on it at 1%. So long before solar has any sort of meaningful impact in terms of changing the pricing or shifting costs, it's capped. Which, you know, we were pretty frustrated with because if we work this situation out so that there's no question that nobody's subsidizing anybody, why do we need a cap? You know, it makes no sense. But uh, that's something we can work on. Uh, one of the things, uh, Jim DuPlessis, who's over in E-Town, was one of the, the uh, advocates for more rights for solar customers. He was great and he, he really took some political hits because he was standing against the tide. Um, he was promised that he'd have an opportunity to make some improvements in the bill during this session. Um, whether that will hold true uh, is anyone's guess. I would hope that the House leadership would honor their pledge to him 
because he really put his heart and his soul into trying to find that sweet spot where everybody was moderately dissatisfied with the situation, which usually means you're getting pretty close to the mark. Um, but uh, so that, that's, that's where we are. I, I hope you have a wonderful day today, and I can't thank you enough for letting me be a small part of it. Yay.